Joe Rogan talks a lot about kettlebells and exercise in general in his podcast. However, if you're not familiar with the exercises that he talks about, you probably don't know what he means. So with this video and maybe with this series, I wanna help you guys out and demonstrate the exercises that Joe Rogan and his guests are talking about in this podcast. But before we get started, I want you to join our free 50K giveaway. Get a chance to win lifetime access to our online kettlebell courses valued over $2,000. Link is in the description. Grüezi miteinander, Gregory von Leberstock here. Joe Rogan is a huge fan of exercise, and I think that's awesome. If you have one of the most popular podcasts on the world talk about exercise frequently, this might lead to the fact that other people are motivated to train as well. And here's where I want to help out by visualizing exercises or training methodologies that Joe Rogan and his guests are talking about. If we want to develop this into a series, I need your support. If you are an avid viewer or listener of Joe Rogan's podcast, please post anything that is exercise, training or kettlebell related down in the comments. The guest on this particular show was Pat McNamara, and he had some great takes about fitness and training in general. Look at you over here. <laughs> There's Look the cinder block. Yeah, yep. I love that. That's in Eagle Lake, Texas, probably three years ago. The exercise Pat was demonstrating is a figure eight with a cinder block, mind you. Now, you don't need to run to your next local hardware store and grab a cinder block. You can also grab a kettlebell and try this type of figure eight, which I believe is an awesome way to train. There's also a variation that I call the circle, where we circle around one leg, and it's borrowed from freestyle juggling. I'll say, hey man, you're gonna throw your back out doing that stuff. No, mother that's, that's building your back. Yeah. You know, working that transverse plane is what guys neglect a lot. Oh, I see two sides to this story, yes, you can most definitely throw your back out and hurt yourself if you start training in the transverse plane. The figure eight that I just showed you is one of those exercises that might lead to injury if, and here's the big if, if you're not ready to handle these exercises. They require skill, they require a basic level of fitness and a basic level of kinesthetic literacy. That's the reason why many of us tout that we want to be careful with these planes of motion and training them because you severely might hurt yourself if you don't know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, however, and you check all the boxes that are necessary to engage in these types of exercises, then you will reap some powerful benefits and more practical and also rotational strength. <laughs> when most guys work out, they live in a, what I call a sagittalistic environment. You know, three planes of motion, frontal, sagittal, transverse. So they're in the sagittal world doing bench press and, and concentration curls. Um, out of the three planes of motion, I would say that transverse is most important. Additionally, when we work out, I would also argue with confidence that it's the plane of motion that is most neglected. I would say that all three planes of motions are important to train in. Since we are bipedal human beings, prehensile handsy creatures, we do a lot of stuff in this sagittal plane. And he's right that if we do too much in this plane, we might miss out on those benefits that I just talked about a few seconds earlier. A Pat is most definitely right that the transverse plane as well as the frontal plane are highly neglected areas that people rarely train in. For the reason I just mentioned again a couple of seconds earlier, because many people lack the required skill and the required kinesthetic literacy. That being said, I wanna show you one of the classic exercises that trains in the transverse plane and that is the windmill watch. Now I wanna show you two exercises that move in the frontal plane. One is with a kettlebell that I call the 360 clean. Watch.
For the next exercise that moves in the frontal, but also a little bit in the transverse plane, I want to show you a front and a back swing in a 360 with a mace, which is the brother of the kettlebell. This is a front swing, this is a back swing, and this is a 360 where we combine both together and we can create this awesome infinity loop. If you want to dig deeper into the neglected way of training where I cover over 10 exercises in the frontal as well as in the transverse plane, then check out this video right now. I always tell people if there's one exercise I would recommend like people who do jujitsu. Turkish get up. Right. It's the least I did romantic. Those last week. It's the least romantic of all workouts. <laughs> Nobody wants yep. to do those goddamn things. Go yep. to a go to a gym. You could go to a hundred gyms. If you're lucky, you find one person doing mm -hmm. Turkish get ups. Yep. Every gym will have someone, someone somewhere is doing bench press and yep. someone's doing curls and lat pull down machine and all that normal shit. The almighty Turkish get up is one of the most popular exercises that you can do with a kettlebell. And it is, technically speaking, a flow where we combine different exercises into one. It's like an anachronism, you know, they're working in a world uh, like a muscle and fitness world still. Mm -hmm. And that's fine, working in isolation, if that's your job. There's three people who, three types of people who should work out in concentration, like doing a, a curl or something, you know, a concentration curl. A professional bodybuilder, right? That's your J-O-B, man, that's your sport. Number two, you're recovering from surgery and atrophy, so it's physical therapy. Number three, you got no fucking idea what you're doing. Or you're a model <clears throat> trying to look sexy. Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's possible too. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Yeah, right. I 100% agree. The term functional strength or functional training has been bastardized. That's why I now call it practical strength or practical training. However, the essence remains the same. Back when I was lifting in the traditional gym with traditional equipment, bodybuilding type style with heavy weights as well, I was strong, yes, but once I picked up the kettlebell for the first time, it completely wiped out my confidence that I was fit. If you train in practical ways, stuff that you also need in the outside world, not only in the gym, then you will experience a different type of fitness. And after delving into kettlebells, I can guarantee you, I'm now the fittest I have ever been, even though I've been lifting for over 10 years. Years. What you really need to ex with exercise is something that's going to mimic what you would actually do in real life. Picking up things, moving them around, mm -hmm. like farmer walks. Yep. Farmer walk, very unglamorous. Yep. Carry a heavy ass kettlebell in one hand mm -hmm. and just walk around for like a half a mile. Yep. And, and it, your it, and forearm would be dying, your yeah. legs would be killing you, your core is going to be shaking. It's amazing. And I like the way you put it. it carry it on once, you know, one load side. that one side at a time. Yeah, that's Ugh. what you got to do. People don't know that. They try to do it Man. with two arms, but with two arms, it balances out, and then mm. it's really just a grip and a leg exercise right. with a little bit of lats and yeah. traps. But really what you want to do is one 100-pounder on one hand. Yep. Carry that. Everything yep. is just kind of balance it out, and then turn around, brutal. put it on the left hand. The farmer's walk can be done with a single weight. In this case, I use a kettlebell, and now my body has to balance everything out. It's a grip exercise, it is a leg exercise, it is a abdominal exercise, it is powerful. If I pick up two, however, like Joe mentioned, now the weight balances itself out, but it's still a beast of an exercise. And what I also think is important to mention, it's one of the best exercise for good posture. One of the things I love to hear is a guy will say, man, I never see you doing the same thing. Yeah. I'm like, well, I pretty much don't. Um, because I don't want to fall into a rut of complacent adaptation. You mm -hmm. know, um, so even guys will say, do you, uh, do you do like Oli lifts? See, yeah, of course. Every once in a while, I'll probably do a deadlift, a standard deadlift once every two months. But I'm doing variations of that, like a shovel deadlift or a suitcase, you know, deadlifts that suck and are, like you said, are not glamorous. There's a lot of good stuff to unpack here. First, let's talk about the complacent adaptation. Now, I agree to a certain extent that if you do one exercise over and over again, your body might adjust to it and gains will be either stagnant or there might even be diminishing 
returns. Soviet sports scientists also point out that our nerve muscle system needs new excitation. New excitation might mean that if your base sport is MMA and that's what you train in, then in your training block schedule, you also want to do a couple of volleyball games, for example. This will excite your nerve muscle system and this in turn might lead to better gains when you go back to your original sport. On the other side, there's also the importance of building a skill. I, for example, do the jerk and the long cycle because I love these two exercises so much every week. I've been doing them for years now. Now, I don't just do them because I fell in love with them, but I also do them because I want to get better at these exercises. Certain exercises require so much coordination and skill that you need to invest thousands and thousands and thousands of reps. Here's why. If you're learning an exercise for the first time, your brain is included in the equation of executing these movement patterns, these motor skills. Because your brain is altering the signals that it's sending to your muscles on a continuous basis. You do the exercise, you get feedback that you're doing it wrong, now you have to adjust and do it differently, so your brain is always involved. That's, by the way, one of the reasons why you might feel so gassed after a workout where you just learned a brand new exercise. Now, if you keep investing those reps, here's the magic that happens. The expertise and the skill is fully developed when your brain is taken out of the equation. And now, your muscle only starts communicating with your spinal cord. That's the reason why I can talk while demonstrating the exercise while other people have a hard time breathing. Pat also mentioned Oli lifts, and these are the Olympic style lifts. For example, a barbell snatch or a barbell clean and jerk. You can also do Olympic style lifting with kettlebells. For example, a kettlebell snatch looks like this. And a clean and jerk looks like this. Further in the discussion, Pat mentioned a shovel deadlift. And I was like, what? I've never heard of this exercise. And here's me thinking that I know almost all of the exercises that are out there. But matter of fact, I learned something as well. And I'm gonna demonstrate to you what a shovel deadlift looks like. A shovel deadlift is a deadlift where you only load one side of the bar. And as soon as you pick it up, you feel your obliques running like crazy. With the suitcase deadlift, however, that Pat was also talking about, I was familiar. And I think kettlebells lend themselves perfectly for this type of deadlift variation. This is what the suitcase deadlift looks like. And from here, we can also do one-sided variations as well. The older you are, the more you yeah. have to warm up, man. Yeah. Damn, yeah. don't jack yourself up. It's called fitness, not brokenness. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, people, that's another thing that people don't like to do because it's not glamorous and because the, people get lazy. They don't want to do that workout, where the, the pre-workout. They don't want to do all the skip and rope and all yeah. the just switching stances and jumping jacks and all that stuff. But you really need to break a sweat, a real sweat, yeah. before you actually start lifting weights. A proper warm-up should fulfill three objectives. Number one is to mobilize the joints. Number two is promoting the production of synovial fluids. These are fluids that help your joints move well. And number three is to get your heart rate up to transfer from your daily routine into training. And by getting your heart rate up, you also want to improve your body's temperature. Dr. Yuri Verkhochansky, who's a legendary Soviet sports scientist, said the following. Increasing the temperature locally increases strength and the amount of time a muscle is able to hold a standard tension or execute standard work. On the other hand, cooling renders a decrease in strength and lengthens contraction time. If you're looking for a solid warm-up routine, your boy got you covered. Check out the link at the top of the screen. Now here's the next thing that you have to do. Like the video, consider subscribing, share it with the friends, and then check out this video. If you're new to kettlebells, 
you have to check this one out. Now, Joe Rogan's into kettlebells most definitely, and I applaud him for it because I think kettlebells are awesome. And if you're just getting started, you need to have a resource that helps you understand the kettlebell from its basic layer of understanding. So here's that perfect video. You gotta watch it right now.